Good morning. This is Dr. Mike Erickson, pastor of a wonderful church in Big Bear City, California, USA. Big Bear Four Square Church. And I'm preaching to you the word of the Lord today, but I know it's going to at least 20 nations where pastors and evangelists and leaders and people are tuned in to hearing this word this morning. The word of the Lord is called the enemy of God, and we don't want to be on that list, do we? And it's from James chapter 4, verse 4. I want to say that God has created the, the earth to be originally an image of what heaven is like. Garden of Eden was, in the Hebrew word, a paradise, which the Hebrew word means a well-manicured garden, a park, a park. And when I think, I've been thinking of how beautiful this earth is, and Pastor Tom and I, and Lynn, we've golfed in Kenya on a course that looks like it was carved out of the Garden of Eden. We go golfed in Nairobi where I remember hitting a drive on the fairway and 17 monkeys came out and took my ball and went back <laughs> in the forest. <laughs> And then I played in Tanzania with the secretary birds and suffer all over the green. And God's earth is beautiful. And I'm sure you have stories and things about seeing some things that just make your heart say, God, you're such a wonderful creator so glorious and and you, we can't even conceive of how you put all this beauty together and it's our job to the best of our ability of course to preserve what we have and God's given us the grace to appreciate all that so we love the earth and its creation right I say all that because we're going to talk about the world today, not about the physical earth, but about the system of thought that alienates people from God. So turn with me to James chapter 4, verse 4. And uh, I'm not talking to you like this, James is, okay? So okay. be careful to understand that. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? Scary words, right? And so... So much so in the heart, heart and mind, James, he's passionately even angry about the, the subject, about people giving themselves first to the things of the world and then trying to fit God into the picture, that he says it again. I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. James chapter 4, verse 4 from the Amplified is really telling in, in the explanation of the scripture. You are like unfaithful wives having illicit love affairs with the world and breaking your marriage vow to God. I pray not. I pray, I pray James, you're wrong about us. Don't you? You're wrong about us. 
But he goes on to say, Don't, do you not know that the world, excuse me, that being the world's friend is being God's enemy? So whoever chooses to be a friend of the world takes his stand as an enemy of God. So it's really important for me at this point for to define the world and worldliness for you, right? I mean, we're not talking about the beautiful earth. But we're talking about a system of values and philosophies that are opposed to God or exclude God. I've heard it said many times, too, too many times to want to remember. Well, if God exists, then I'm him. Well, if you're God, then you do a pretty poor job of it. And, but people actually think that they are the universe, they are God, they are this or that, as if the universe is anything. God is personal, he's imminent, intimately involved with us, he's transcendent, he's greater than his creation. But there are many philosophies and values today that are actually opposed to God. You have Christian University who votes to have Christian ethics and morals and involvement. You have some board members on those Christian universities that are absolutely adamant against any involvement of God in the Christian university. How's that work? How those people get on that board? They got in their bo the, those boards by the power of the enemy so that they could oppose God. And, and truly the scripture says that they have become God's enemies. Worldliness of the world to be independent of God in be belief and in practice. Living, thinking, and talking as if God does not exist. You know one of the thing one of the songs Frank Sinatra sang that really exhibits this, it's a song my way. Terrible song, not a Christian song at all. I would never bound the knee. I've done this and I've done it my way, right? Beautiful too, and I love the orchestra behind it. Frank Sinatra, one of my favorite singers. But that song exemplifies everything we're talking about. Uh, that's world and worldly, I did it my way. I'm not going to pray, I'm not going to bow my knee, I never bowed to anyone, I did it my way. Thank God we are adverse to such confessions, we're not wanting at all to say, God, you know I did the best I can, I did it my way. No, not at all. Saying, Lord, I, I've done my best in my life to trust you, to rely upon you, to be your child, to be dependent on you, to do it your way. As a matter of fact, one of the things that's wrong with practice of Christianity is that a lot of Christians live their life as if God does not exist. And that's the definition of worldliness that James is so passionate about. Hebrews 11 verse 6 tells us 
what we need to do and how a walk with God starts. And it is impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him, and I certainly do, must believe that God exists. God is. And God correctly defined because he's not a thought, he's just not a pleasant vibe, he's just not positive energy. God is a person who is the creator of everything, exclusively of everything but himself. And that he rewards those who sincerely, diligently seek him. How are we doing? You know, I'm I'm not talking about your car. I'm not talking about your house. House. I'm not talking about your job. I'm not talking about your community. I'm talking about the things that people love more than loving God. So, what does the world offer? Let's go to First John chapter two, verse fifteen through seventeen. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure. Isn't this at the root of drug and alcohol problems? Vices. Eric and I were talking just before about losing people to such things. A craving for everything we see. Oh, I want that. Oh, I love that. Oh, yeah, if I just had that, I could be happy. For Christians, we don't talk like that because if we have more Jesus, we will be happy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Our happiness is not found in things. For some people, they see they get their happiness from food. Well, a little bit. But our source of happiness is not in those things. But if we crave things more than we have a love for God, God, the wrong person is sitting on the throne. Amen? And pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from his, this world. And this world is fading away. You know what? Peter, Second Peter tells us that the elements will burn with fervent heat. It's going. <coughs> and this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Got to have it. People say, got to have it. Got to have this. Got to have that. Our focus is not here. Our focus is in heaven, our eternal dwelling. And we lay up treasures for heaven. And we're not really concerned about laying up treasures for earth. Reminds me about the millionaire who really scrunched, pinched pennies, saved and saved, became an old man and had 50 some million dollars. But he had, he was 
bent on saving it and could not answer the question, what are you saving it for? Didn't know. He finally died and his value went with him. Jesus told a similar story and then at the end of that story, which is similar to what I just shared with you, Jesus said, what good is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? The Amplified from this 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 gives the, uh, expounds on this a little bit to help us. Do not love or cherish the world or things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, food, sexual desires, pleasures, lust of the flesh. You know what lust is? Uh, it's an insatiable desire that can never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. Craving for sensual gratification of the lust of the eyes, greedy longings of the mind, and the pride of life, assurance, in one's own resources or in the stability of earthly things. I got it together, I got enough saved, I got this, I got that, and I'm secure and all. But God says, you have built on a wrong foundation when all the things that you have are not your security. Our security belongs in the hands of God and God alone. Amen. Now, if you have all those things and God is your resource and your security, you're in good shape. Right? First things first. God first, everything else next. You know what the biggest bill I ever seen of currency was from an uh, African country, I think it was Zimbabwe. And this is funny. A $13 trillion bill. Well, that must be worth something, right? It wasn't worth the powder to blow it up with. Okay? So, but it said 13 trillion shillings or something, whatever it was, on the bill. I think I, I think I want to order one of those and just have it. I got 13 trillion shillings. These do not come from the Father, but are from the world itself. And the world passes away and disappears, and with it forbidden cravings. The passionate desires, the lust of it. But he who does the will of God and carries out his purpose in his life abides and remains forever that's where i want us to go now if god has declared that the world system is his enemy then we should be adverse to such thinking and morality and philosophies as well we're not we're, we're not going to be a part of that we're going to hate sin like God hates sin, love people like God loves people, walk in righteousness and holiness, 
even if it costs us something. Now, what about the world? Well, the Bible talks about it being, actually being controlled by the sinful nature. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is saying almost the same thing that James has said and that John has said. Listen to what Paul is saying. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. Dear brothers and sisters, he's talking to the Christians, his brothers and sisters. When I was with you, I couldn't talk about to you as I would to spiritual people. I had to talk to you as though you belonged to this world or as though you were infants in Christ. You know what an infant is by definition? Too young to walk, too young to talk. Can't talk with the Lord, can't walk with the Lord, too young. Definition of an infant. I had to feed you with milk, not with solid food, because you weren't ready for anything stronger, and still you aren't ready for you are still controlled by your sinful nature. God, take me off that list. I don't want to be so spiritually dull because I've given myself to the sinful nature. You are jealous of one another and quarrel with one another, each other. This is what James says. We're going to go into more of that next week. Doesn't that prove you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like the people of the world? Hey, if you have jealousy, you know that's the work of the flesh. Oh, I really would like that truck. Oh, beautiful truck. Where does that come from? That comes from an enemy is trying to sow jealousy and division in my heart towards anyone or anything. Right? Doesn't that prove that you're controlled by your sinful nature? Aren't you living like the people in the world? He says this in Galatians chapter 6 verse 14. Paul says, As for me... I will never boast about anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because of that cross, my interest in the world has been crucified. Hey, you, you want a lot of money? Somebody will try to kill you for it. You want a lot of things, and I was in Mexico City with Victor, and we stayed with David, and uh, oh, I forget the young woman's name, it'll come to me. And they had a business of imitating perfumes, and they had these fancy perfume shops all over Mexico City, I think it's six or eight of them. And so he had an income of thousands of dollars per month, thousands in American dollars. Nice car, 10,000 square foot house, beautiful house, nice food, Laura was her name. So David and Lord loved the Lord. But then he got so big, he started getting death threats towards himself and his children. Started getting kidnapping threats and things like that against his wife. So they prayed about it and decided that God has called David and Lord to be pastors in Mexico 
So they sold everything and scaled down as serving the Lord. He said, you know, it's a scary thing to be rich down in Mexico. Well, But his, their heart was always right. Now their pastor is preaching for the Lord and the things are not the things that the world sees them as they, as they are. But they're a tool of God's grace and now they have things in mind to serve God. Isn't that great? Colossians chapter 2 verse 8 Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking. Nonsense. Philosophies of high sounding nonsense. And from the spiritual powers of this world. You see that the world and its system and all its philosophies we're talking about has spiritual forces beyond, behind them. The, and they come against us. And, and if we're not careful, we can let the world and its demonic forces infiltrate into our lives and actually steal what God has wanted to do in our lives. But you won't, right? You won't let him. Rather than from his Christ. Now I'm going to continue preaching because I'm feeling pretty good this morning. <laughs> One thing about the world is business as usual. Now let me look to have you turn to what Jesus said in the last days. In Luke chapter 17, verse 26 and 27. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. In those days, the people enjoyed banquets. How about you? You enjoy that? Well, I do. I just don't want to be business as usual in this sense and actually forget God while I'm feasting, right? This is what he says. The people enjoyed banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time that Noah entered his boat and the flood came and destroyed them all. And the world will be as the days of Lot. People went about their daily business, eating business as usual, eating and drinking, buying and selling, farming and building. You notice here that Jesus is talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, but he doesn't talk to us about Sodom and Gomorrah like Moses did in recurring the story. He doesn't mention homosexuality, which was a huge problem. He doesn't mention the debauchery and the sexual activity. That was a huge problem. But Jesus is going for something that's more subtle. Business as usual. Living as if God does not exist. When about their daily business eating and drinking, having a good time, buying and selling, farming and building. What's wrong with those things? Nothing. But when business as usual is living as if God does not exist, it becomes everything. Verse 29, Until the morning lot left Sodom, then fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them. Verse 30 is the key and you want to highlight it. Yes, it will be business as usual 
right up to the time and the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Living as if God does not exist is of the world. Being so busy that you have no time for God is the world. Saying yes to everything but not saying yes to God and the right things is of the world. I so desire that Christians make excuses for everything so they can be in the house of the Lord. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry I can't do that. I, I want to be in church. And obviously you guys are like that. But instead I hear a lot of, oh, you know what, My, I broke a fingernail and so I'm going to be taking care of that. So I can't come. And after a while the excuses start sounding pretty silly. Verse 30, I want to say it again. Yes, it is. It will be business as usual right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. I want to leave us with 1 John 3.13. So in the process, so don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you because you make choices for God and not choices that align you with them. The world's going to hate you even more. What's wrong with that in my day? Jesus freak. You made it for bad. I wore it as a badge of honor. Yes, I'm a Jesus freak. Right? And the world is, in, especially in America, the world's going to hate us even more than it does now because we serve the living and risen God and we refuse to be a part of the world system with all its vain philosophies and all its lack of morality. Amen. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for my faithful friends in the house who have joined me in praying right now. I pray that you would keep us from your enemy, the world system and its philosophies, and help us to serve you and love you. Bless my friends. Give them a great week. And I thank you for them. In Jesus' name, amen.